Just before I start, I did want to kind of bring special greetings from the TUC to members of uh, the UCU and all staff unions here, and all, indeed all trade unionists, and, a, and perhaps a, a special mention to our friends in the National Union of Students, who I think um, have been essential allies in fighting for a living wage in this university and in this city. So um, it's great for any members. Uh, very good to see people here tonight. Um, I should, of course, clarify, uh, when I mention the living wage, I am, of course, talking about the real one, uh, not the cut price version uh, invented by the government spin doctors, uh, which, when combined with the planned cuts to universal credit, will actually leave many working families worse off. But to my talk, it is an absolute pleasure to be here uh, at Murray Edwards, an institution dedicated to the advancement of women, and one lucky enough to be led by the brilliant Barbara Stocking. Uh, I, I noticed that the Financial Times once described Barbara as, and I quote, a mild-mannered toughie, uh, <laughs> by which I mean that for all her, I think they meant, uh, that for all her charm and intelligence, when it comes to tackling injustice, Barbara is not one to be messed with. Uh, as everyone knows, before becoming president, of this college. Barbara held a number of high profile roles in the NHS, in Oxfam, in the United Nations. And for me, she is the ultimate working class girl made good uh, in, in the very best meaning of that phrase. She's an inspiration to women who believe that whatever field we find ourselves in, we don't have the luxury of celebrating our own advancement until every single woman in every walk of life has that same chance. Now, my own chosen path has been trade unionism, a movement that's still six million strong, and for the first time in its history, has a membership that is 50-50 men and women. Now, it's true to say more generally that there's been progress in the representation of women in our public life. But while the pay gap has narrowed, it's still far too wide. And millions of women still struggle to break through what an old friend of mine once described as the glass skirting board, um, never mind the glass ceiling. So that battle for gender equality uh, remains a very urgent one. And income inequality, of course, takes many different forms. Gender for sure, race too but also, and not to be forgotten, class. The title of my talk, as Marcus has said, is Are Trade Unions Essential to Reducing Income Inequality? And I could save us all a lot of time tonight uh, by giving you the simple answer, yes, but you don't get off that lightly. Uh, it is true to say that there is now a shed load of evidence from the UK and around the world produced by organisations as diverse as the Resolution Foundation and the International Monetary Fund that shows a clear correlation between the strength of union membership and collective bargaining coverage on the one hand and the degree of pay solidarity and fairness on the other. Every day of the week, unions and our workplace reps are working with employers to bring people new learning and training opportunities, more paid time off to spend with their loved ones, healthier and so more productive workplaces, and fairer pay packets. There is evidence that where unions are present in workplaces, there is more uh, chance of there being pay solidarity more for the lower paid, less for the top, and fairer, a fairer deal all around. So perhaps the really interesting question to ask is why, given that evidence base, those in positions of power appear to be so reluctant to draw the obvious conclusion that one of the best ways to see income inequality reduce would be to help union membership and influence grow. Part of the answer, of course, to this conundrum is that inequality of income goes hand in hand with inequality of power. 
And last week, we saw the embodiment of that alliance in the gathering of the political and economic elites in Davos. Now, I've attended the World Economic Forum, I suspect, fewer times than Barbara, just a couple of times uh, for me, as part of a small but beautifully formed international uh, delegation of trade union leaders. And it's held in a pretty picture postcard ski resort, all cute cabins and twinkly lights, where people gather every year to debate, relax, and be entertained. I like to think of it as a kind of butlins for the rich. Um, the first time I attended, the big theme of that gathering uh, was inequality. Oxfam had just produced a report showing that half the world's wealth was owned by a wealthy elite so small that it could fit into a double-decker bus. Although perhaps uh, for Davos, it would have been more appropriate to say it was so small they could have fitted into a cable car or a private jet. Oxfam's report was a milestone one in explaining the nature of global inequality today. And it built on previous research showing that growing inequality was not just a consequence of that financial crash of uh, 2008. Rather, it was one of the key drivers of it. And that while uh, there was some evidence to show that inequality between countries may be reducing, inequality within countries has rocketed. Of course, there was a certain irony in Davos that year that some of the very same people who had caused the mess in the first place had appointed themselves as the best judges of how to clear it up. Some might say it would be a bit like asking the Hatton Garden gang to come up with ideas about how to keep your jewellery safe. Uh, my memory is that the policy debates, certainly the debates I attended um, that ensued, uh, were not exactly muscular, uh, that proposed solutions were at best tepid, and in any case, by the next time I visited, the following year, Davos had already done inequality and had moved on to other issues. Now, to be fair, I think it's true to say in my experience that members of the elite often show real concern about global poverty. But while both are important, I think it's important to remember that tackling poverty and tackling inequality are not the same thing. Of course, it's too easy to be cynical. Uh, although perhaps that's a little bit forgivable in a week when the Chancellor George Osborne told us that getting Google to pay a fraction of the corporate tax they owe us was, and I quote, a major success. When we hear more about how the government is using the EU referendum renegotiation to launch yet another crackdown on benefits, and at a time when the UK government is progressing a bill through Parliament that bashes the last line of defence against workplace inequality, trade unions. To understand all of this, I thought it might be helpful just to think, imagine ourselves back to a decade ago and think about what, would, what we'd be discussing if we'd met uh, back in January 2006. Back then, the economy seemed to be humming along nicely, uh, I know that somewhere in the number 10 policy unit, advisers were worried that the total share of wealth going to wages appeared to be shrinking. Unions were also warning that our members were only maintaining living standards by stacking up household debt. But elsewhere, pundits talked about the great moderation, sustainable growth with low inflation. And while the Chancellor Gordon Brown did not actually claim to have abolished boom and bust, there was a sense that uh, the good times looked set to roll. Then it all went belly up. The collapse of Lehman Brothers precip precipitated the worst financial crash uh, since the Wall Street crash. That caused the longest recession since the Great Depression, and that led to the most prolonged squeeze on living standards since the Victorian times. Now, some people on the left 
uh, saw Lehman Brothers as an epoch-defining moment, signalling the end of the neoliberal ideology that had held sway since the 1970s, and that we'd see uh, the beginning of a new era, a progressive economic paradigm shift. Well, eight years on, it doesn't feel like it's quite worked out that way, <laughs> or at least so far. Free market capitalism is still very much alive and kicking. Governments are still cutting regulation and employment rights for workers. And while freedom of movement for labour is under severe uh, pressure in terms of the current debate around the EU, finance capital remains footloose and fancy free. But as the banks we bailed out have pretty much returned to business and bonuses as usual, it's a very different story for everybody else. What began as a crisis in the private sector has been reframed quite deliberately into a crisis of the public sector. Never mind the tens of billions of the taxpayers' money uh, that propped up the banks or the hundreds of billions provided in various liquidity schemes from the Bank of England, the problem was redefined as too much government spending on public services and welfare. And as real wages and so tax receipts fell, the consequent deficit became an excuse to shrink the state. Now, we're now in the midst of a decade of austerity. And it's ordinary people, I would say particularly young people and particularly women, who are suffering the consequences. The resilience of neoliberalism, the political cult of austerity, the rapid growth of casual jobs, all add fuel to the inequality fire. Britain is more unequal today than at any point in our modern history. And I think we're all pretty much uh, familiar with the headline trends, how of the 34 OECD countries, Britain ranks as the fourth most unequal in terms of income distribution, how we were the only G7 country to see inequality rise between 2000 and 2014, and how those differentials are getting wiser. According to the latest Sunday Times rich list after the crash, as workers continue to face real pay cuts, the wealth of the richest 1,000 people and um, families, I should say, more than doubled. Never mind trickle down, this was hoover up on an industrial scale. And of course, there's been a radical shift within the capitalist class itself. While manufacturing is in recession, hedge fund boys calling the shots. Britain today is an increasingly divided nation, one of food banks on the one hand, Michelin star restaurants on the other, sky-high rents for small flats and underground cinemas being built under great big mansions, benefit cuts for the poor, tax cuts for the rich. And what's going on in the jobs market and inside workplaces goes a long way to explain how inequality has become entrenched. Today, the average annual pay package for a FTSE 100 chief executive is five million pounds. That's 183 times the average salary. Top pay has risen by 40% since the crash. Compare that to average workers. And how long do you suppose it takes Britain's highest paid director to earn what a worker on the living wage earns in a year, a whole year? How long? A day? Half a day? Not even close. The answer is 49 minutes. Of course, we're told that these rewards are based on performance and merit. But I think it would require the skill of Houdini to explain why the performance of those at the top could have so outstripped the performance of the workforce they are supposed to lead. As, one, as the uh, great American economist J.K. Galbraith once said, the salary of a chief executive of a large corporation 
is not a market award for achievement. It is instead frequently in the nature of a warm personal gesture by the individual to himself. At the other end of the income spectrum, of course, it's a very different story. According to the Living Wage Foundation, six million workers, almost a quarter of the British workforce now, earn less than the living wage. The UK's tale of low-paid, low-skilled, low-productivity work is the longest of all the OECD advanced industrial nations. And since the crash, those in the middle are now on average worse off in real terms to the tune of £44 a week. That is a decade of lost wages. Early last year, the TUC published new research setting out the scale of the challenge we face. And yes, we've made some progress in some areas, the gender pay gap, slightly. And as the government is very fond of telling us, more people are in paid work. But compared to the 1980s, you could say that we've merely swapped mass unemployment for mass insecurity and low pay. We've got underemployment, bogus self-employment, involuntary part-time work. Uh, those are all very high. And the number of women stuck on zero hours and short-term contracts has actually risen. So yes, we have had a recovery for big business and the super rich, for sure, but not yet a recovery for ordinary working people. And in many ways, we seem to be sleepwalking back to the mistakes that got us into this mess in the first place. Financial and property speculation, rising household debt, and most of all, of course, those turbocharged levels of income inequality. There's a significant impact on social stability and economic growth too. The OECD has calculated that the British economy would be more than 20% bigger had the gap between rich and poor not widened since the 1980s. Now, nobody is pretending that reversing this tide will be quick or easy. Rising inequality has been a reality since the late 1970s when that post-war Keynesian settlement was superseded uh, by the free market project of the new right. And getting the pendulum to swing the other way could take years, perhaps decades. But in my view, that's all the more reason to start working on it now. As a starting point, we need to realise that inequality is not inevitable. For all the profound challenges we face from globalisation, mass migration, the march of the robots, industrial change, and of course that growing power of finance capital, the gap between rich and poor can be reversed. Inequality is the result of deliberate policy decisions to deregulate the financial system, cut rights at work, restrict trade unions, and slash taxes for the rich and big business. Decisions that, in summary, put too much power and wealth in the hands of too few. But collectively, we can decide to do things differently, to make decent jobs, investment in affordable homes, higher productivity, decent public services, and a greener economy, our central aim. And of course, we need to get that balance of tax and spend right. But that must be built on tax justice, with everyone paying their fair share. And by everyone, I mean that includes the likes of Amazon, Starbucks, and even Google. In my view, Oxfam and the TUC and many others have also made a strong case for a Robin Hood tax on financial transactions that, as well as raising a lot of money for the public purse, could also help put the brake on excessive speculation in the city. And rather than being a mere facilitator of a free market race to the bottom, we also need to rethink the role of the state, one that could build a very different kind of economy to live, deliver good jobs, skills and opportunities to the regions and communities that need them most. And that would require an intelligent industrial strategy, nurturing uh, the industries and sectors that are the success stories of the future, from the creative sector, aerospace, uh, biotechnology, green manufacturing, 
and of course standing up for key foundation industries like steel. Investment in higher education, but also vocational education, creating high quality apprenticeships, not Mickey Mouse schemes. And financial reform, ensuring that the banks work for us, creating a proper state investment bank to help kickstart the industries of the future. More broadly, we need to build better companies with a fairer distribution of reward. Now, it's great that so many firms are signing up to the living wage, but there is a difference between a living wage and what we define as a fair wage. A fair wage is where workers get to say uh, and get to collectively bargain with employers over the price of their own labour. To redistribute wealth, we need to redistribute power. And that's why we've argued for a seat for workers on those uh, top pay company committees, so that the boss has to look a representative of their own workforce in the eye and explain and justify their rewards. It's why we'd like to go further and see workers on the boards, uh, something that is now a requirement in the majority of other EU member states. After all, nobody has a greater interest in the long-term success of a company than the people and the communities whose livelihoods depend on it. And then there is the question of rights. It's funny, isn't it, how we constantly hear about the need to remove burdens on business, to cut red tape, and to give employers even greater freedom to hire and fire. Yet the fact is, Britain has already the most flexible, the most deregulated labour market in the OECD. Stripping away workers' rights is not a good answer to tackling Britain's poor productivity record. Of course, in the short term, you can improve productivity by sweating and sacking workers. But if you let the likes of uh, Sports Direct, say, get away with treating people with like dirt, all that happens is that you undercut the decent employers and launch that unholy race to the bottom. The best way to boost productivity is through more investment and getting the best out of staff. Uh, by treating them fairly. That means we need stronger employment rights and stronger enforcement of rights too. And by the way, I think that has to include free access to justice. Access to justice for workers should depend on the strength of your claim, not the size of your wallet. Nowhere is the case for action stronger than when it comes to those challenges facing women. From the motherhood penalty to poor quality part-time work, we need to address both the causes and the consequences of gender inequality. And that means delivering decent, affordable childcare and adult social care on which millions of families depend, offering genuinely flexible uh, work that suits workers, not just uh, employers, humane maternity and paternity leave. Um, and right through to action to tackle that everyday sexism that wastes so much talent and causes so much misery. And really getting to grips with occupational segregation that sees most low-paid part-time work uh, done by women and most high-paid work done by men. But I've saved the best bit till last. Our final priority must be to promote stronger unions. Because the fact remains that more trade union membership and more collective bargaining coverage would mean less income inequality. Uh, research by Ewan McGar... I hope I'm getting the pronunciation right. Uh, Ewan McGahy, McGahy sorry, uh, from King's College reports how close the historical correlation between unionisation and greater in income equality really is. After the Wages Council Act of 1945, union membership was on a rising trajectory for the next 35 years, as was income equality. In the mid-70s, when half the workforce carried a union card, 
two-thirds of our GDP ended up in workers' wage packets. Now, with around a quarter of workers in a union, it's barely more than half. I'm not saying it's the only reason, but it's one key factor. And that decline um, in union membership can be traced back to the 1980s, when Margaret Thatcher's government introduced a series of acts to reduce the power of institutions, which she famously described as the enemy within. Although introducing a new right to recognition, the new Labour governments of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown essentially left that Thatcherite industrial relations architecture intact. And now we have a government in power that is seeking to introduce some of the most draconian restrictions on trade unions anywhere uh, in the developed world. Even the IMF and OECD are urging policymakers to boost the bargaining power of ordinary workers. But the government's trade union bill is designed to deliver the exact opposite. The new legislation attacks something which is recognised as a fundamental British liberty, the right to withdraw your labour. Going on strike is always a last resort, but without it, faced with an employer who uh, just won't list, listen or won't compromise, workers would be left powerless. The government's bill has been described as the biggest attack on trade unions for 30 years. It aims to lift the ban on employers using agency workers to break strikes, something that has been banned for more than four decades. It would allow state interference in peaceful pickets and protests. I should have worn my armband tonight. That's going to be a requirement too. That not only undermine unions and civil liberties, uh, but according uh, to senior uh, police con uh, chief constables and indeed the police federation, would waste police time. And it would give employers new ways to take us to court, to attack our funds, to win injunctions, and ultimately sequestration, including by opening the way to state investigations of our financial and membership records, which uh, even some of the worst of the blacklisters could never have dreamed of. It's perhaps little wonder that even the Conservative MP David Davis has likened parts of the bill as being more fitting to Franco Spain than a modern democracy like Britain. And the upshot is, if successful, this bill would make it much harder for unions to protect jobs, services and pay. And Britain, as a result, would become even more unequal. Now, our campaign against the bill has been fronted quite deliberately by three people who are what I would describe as typical strikers. Natalie, a midwife, who voted to take strike action when Jeremy Hunt refused to honour the 1% pay award, which that independent pay review body had said was fair and affordable. Um, and by the way, as you know, the midwives won. Lucy is our, our second person. She is a firefighter who went on strike to save her local station and keep it open, and she won. And Daisy is the third one. She's a cinema worker who, after 13 days of, taking, uh, 13 days of strike action, finally won an extraordinary 26% pay rise. Um, although, and this will give you a little indication of what they were earning in the first place, Daisy and her workmates are still carrying on the campaign to be paid the London living wage. Nevertheless, a big, big achievement that was only won when they, as a last resort, exercised that right to go on strike. So yes, unions are essential uh, to winning greater income equality. I think Lucy, Natalie and Daisy are living proof of that today just as the Ford sewing machinists, the Cradley uh, Heath chain makers, and of course, the East London match women were, were before them. But as with the past, reversing that great tide of unfairness will require us to build broader and more populist alliances 
on a much bigger scale. As well as more members and activists, we need new friends to help us along the way. New popular alliances that include faith and community groups um, and all those who know that there is an alternative. And yes, by the way, I do recognise that unions need to change too. We need to adapt to a new digital economy where increasingly, I think, certainly in my experience for the younger generation in particular, but also uh, industries like hotel and catering and creative, uh, right through from blue collar to white collar, where they're using crowdsourcing and many of those workers don't even know who their ultimate employer is, uh, let alone work for one that is ready to recognise a trade union. But we also need a change in political values and mindsets too. I think we need a clean break from the free market orthodoxy of the past three and a half decades. We need a new economic model and we need a new sense of moral mission where inequality is neither seen as inevitable nor desirable, where the interests of workers and unions are seen as at least as important as those of the business and banks, and where decent work, pay and rights are at the heart of policy making. Now, as I keep saying, I'm not naive enough to think that change will be quick or easy, certainly at the moment in Britain as, a, as elsewhere, where the, uh, the right is in power. Uh, but I think there, is, there are some signs of hope that things are shifting. In this country, uh, again, open for debate, uh, but the Labour Party is perhaps going through a painful but perhaps necessary process of rejecting uh, those politics of austerity. In the United States, uh, the socialist Bernie Sanders has shaken up the Democratic campaign for nomination just as much as Donald Trump has shaken that of the Republicans. And in Spain, the strong showing of anti-austerity Podemos and anti-corruption citizens in December's elections shows that there are people around Europe who are prepared to vote for change. I think there is a concern that we can't just carry on as we are, that the measure of our success is not just how much wealth we produce, but how people share in it, uh, and that trade unions, who are still the biggest independent democratic membership organisation in Britain and around the globe, must be at the heart of a campaign for a post-crash New Deal for equality. So it may be a long road and it certainly won't be an easy one. Uh, but I hope that as with Barbara, our opponents may discover that we are all mild-mannered toughies now. Thank you very much.